introducing our speaker, um, Ted Cheeseman's love of seabirds stems from a lifetime of guiding travelers to their remote breeding colonies. After completing a master's degree in tropical conservation biology at Duke University, Ted returned to California to lead expeditions with Cheeseman's ecology safaris. On his voyages to Antarctica, Ted has witnessed the decline of his favorite species, the wandering albatross, inspiring him to become involved with conservation efforts to preserve these birds. And uh, we are very fortunate to have um, Ted as our speaker tonight, uh, all the way from the Bay Area. So please welcome Ted Cheeseman. Last month, the intention of mine was to be down in Antarctica. I've been uh, involved with and organizing, and then for the last decade, leading uh, expeditions to Antarctica for a couple, well, for about 20 years now. And uh, um, this year, I decided to do this personal expedition myself and uh, seven other folks to go into an emperor penguin colony, which is about the hardest set of birds to get to on the planet these days. Um, I had the pleasure of going here uh, some years ago when a ship called the Captain Kolebnikov could get you there and you'd get near and then go by helicopter and then a bunch of wands were set out and they said, hey, okay, you can be in this box and look at the birds. And that was really wonderful to be able to be there, but I don't really go to Antarctica to be in a box. Um, I uh, had a group of 20 folks with me and um, we loved it. It was fantastic because how could it not be to be amongst these animals? But I also at the same time conceived of this trip to go down there and cross the mountain ranges and sea ice and such to get the, the birds. Unfortunately because of an illness in the family and, um, and sea ice conditions both conspiring against us, we had to postpone the expedition. So, um, as you're down there, they're just fledging now, but, um, but uh, so hopefully I'll get to them in a couple of years, and instead I will talk to you about birds that I've spent a lot more time with, which is uh, the, of course, emperor penguins are seabirds, but um, those that inhabit the, the open oceans of the southern ocean and, uh, and oceans as a whole. Um, so... Here, of all things. <laughs> At length did cross an albatross. Through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul. We hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it never had ate, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow, and came every day for food or play, came to Mariner's Hollow. In mist or cloud, on master shroud, it perched for vespers nine, while all the night, through fog smoke white, glimmered the white moonshine. God, God save me, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plagued thee thus. Why looks thou so with my crossbow? I shot the albatross. The yeah, albatross have this rather mythical quality to them, and they appear in stories, especially mariner stories, of course, this very symbolic uh, you know, rhyme of the ancient mariner. Um, I, for my part, was a tropical biologist, or on, well on my way to be there, and then I actually sat down with this bird for most of an af afternoon on Albatross Island, where tourists are no longer allowed to go, and totally fell in love. It happens to be a male bird, of all things, but, um, <laughs> but so it's really been a pleasure to be able to take folks to this, my wife, uh, to see these birds. Um, in these places where the, the abundance is on a scale that's truly humbling, I think. There's not many places in the world where the scale of humans is small and the scale of nature is large. We often kind of forget and let things present, present themselves the other way around. But in these places where 
We are very few, and they are many here, Black Rod Albatross on Steeple Jason Island, or uh, King Penguins on, uh, in Salisbury Plain, South Georgia Island. Here is a small piece, um, <laughs> a larger piece, and most of the colony, um, which, you know, as a human, oops, wrong picture. We, we feel very small there, which I think is a very appropriate perspective. Um, and uh, to come to understand these birds, it's, you know, the logical way humans first began to study them, I suppose first was shoot them or club them and dissect them and that sort of thing. But then to look at their behavior, it was typically a, you know, go to their breeding colonies and watch them and do, make very diligent notes and have a great time watching the little babies grow and weigh the babies along the way, which is great and it's fantastic and it's very relevant to their biology, but the truth is it's a, it's a very narrow and small piece of what the, these birds truly are. It'd be sort of akin to only studying people, human, you know, human anthropology by watching somebody, say, asleep in bed and not really doing much of uh, uh, the, the rest of our lives. So the reality is just because of proximity, just because of access, when we study them on their, on their nesting grounds, which we think of as their homes, we're only seeing a very, very small part of their lives. Yet when these birds, these are uh, Royal Albatross uh, from Campbell Island, um, when these birds turn and go out to sea, that's when they're really going into their home. And um, it's maybe a subtle difference to think of these. You know, we often say, oh yeah, this bird goes out to sea and it doesn't come back to land for seven years after fledging. Well, what's come back to land? It's really a seabird. It lives out there. Land is only relevant to it because it needs a place to drop an egg and raise a chick until that chick can go truly into its home. And I, I, I mean, this isn't any scientific revelation, but I do think it's quite relevant, especially in that uh, the decline of some of the species, we have to manage them and we have to frame our management of them in the knowledge that these are open ocean animals that truly have no boundaries. Um, they are just in, in, in the environment that they can live you know, that they are casually and comfortably at home in, it's an environment that is absolutely terrifying to the unaided human being. It was only, it's only this in the last century that we've been able to go into these environments and not have a reasonable expectation of not coming back. It's uh, truly these open oceans, especially the southern ocean here, just uh, some tintado petrels alongside the ship. The alternative conditions down there, they do sometimes happen, absolutely flat, gloriously calm seas that were, um, you know, in these kinds of uh, circumstances, the albatross will typically not even be flying. It took finding a juvenile albatross, which was the only bird foolish enough not to just be sitting, but up there pumping his wings and flying along to, to, to make a decent photograph out of this beautiful uh, scene for me, but um, more often than not, if there's a good bit of wind, the birds are quite at home and finding their way, finding food and finding uh, a, a, an incredible living out of um, the desert that is the open ocean. Um, the other extreme of southern ocean seabirds and open ocean birds are these, uh, these, these fine little quote-unquote flightless penguins, which um, very different approach to, to life, but uh, very effective in that they've found places where they can breed successfully even while they're not protected from land predators because they breed on islands and places far from any land predators and swim uh, or rather fly through the water. I'll talk about their biology a whole bunch more further on, but just a little quick run through so the cast of characters, uh, my subjects here, the albatross and tube noses as a whole, I call them tube noses, I should have a laser pointer, but um, this little hole up here, 
uh, gives the birds their name, the Procelliformes. They carry everything from the, the albatross on down to the little um, storm petrels, the sooty shear waters that you see out here certain times of the year by hundreds and thousands. Are a very, very successful group. Um, depends albatross, some 40 species, depending on how you divide it up. If you're like New Zealanders who tend to call each different island's population in different species, um, you get a few more. I'm a little skeptical of that, but um, but uh, there, this is that little um, hole is just the exit point for saline um, or salty brine that they excrete. They have the mechanics to be able to separate salt from their food. We do as well, of course. You can swallow salt water and be fine. It doesn't make your blood quickly get too saline. They do it much more effectively and efficiently than we do. That uh, So that little hole that gives them the name tube noses is, uh, is just sort of the the vent pipe of it. That was a wandering albatross here, a waved albatross, uh, the most tropical of albatross, uh, waved albatross living in the, in the Galapagos, breeding in the Galapagos, which has this incredible sort of staccato, ritualized uh, breeding dance that makes you feel like it's truly an ancient bird. These birds are probably um, not the individual species, but as a group, probably some 40 million years old. And sex successful courtship there gives you this little <laughs> faith that only a mother can love. But, uh, <laughs> other tropical albatross, the black footed. I've never been out to Midway, uh, but um, so I had to borrow slides here. Lazan, um, they're there out um, French Frigate Shoals in Midway. The, the actual largest albatross colonies in the world. Absolutely amazing. And what's fantastic about these sites is um, they would actually have a, um, a, a short-tailed albatross, one of the rarest of them, of the world's albatross, that successfully fledged, I think it was 2011, that uh, first successfully fledged a short-tailed albatross here. This is a bird that used to be quite abundant and experienced an absolute holocaust um, on its breeding islands off of Japan. Um, fortunately, there were a few juveniles at sea in the years that all the birds were killed, but those birds that reestablished a breeding colony almost all live on an active volcano. So it's pretty exciting that there's a few birds in this previous photo. These are decoys and playing you know, recordings, trying to get the birds to come down and nest. For a number of years, they had a bird coming in, uh, birds coming in, but then finally a successfully fledged chick. I don't know how, uh, if it's known what's happened to that chick since. But uh, again, across, running across a few more species. These are the mid-sized albatross, the uh, small to mid-sized, about, uh, about a six foot or so wingspan. Black-browed albatross, probably the world's most numerous uh, species um, nesting in the Southern Ocean. Um, the heart of species diversity of albatross is uh, over in New Zealand and Australia and their sub-Antarctic islands here. Salmon's albatross from over there. Uh, White-capped albatross um, on its... Uh, on its breeding grounds. Um, personally, one of my favorite, my favorite two species of birds, the other being the wandering albatross. The light mantle city albatross, not just because of that beautiful plumage, but it has this sleek wings that are, that are designed for flying along cliffs. And uh, my wife and I do a lot of fun things together. We surf and we climb and we ski, but we can't do this mutual courtship flight flying in parallel along sea cliffs. I think that'd be a really wonderful way to spend your life. What's fun to watch is if you go down to South Georgia in the early season, these birds haven't seen each other for two years, or a, a season and a half, essentially. They breed every other year. So they're out at, at, at sea, not, not really uh, connected in the off-season, flying maybe around the world in the year that they're not breeding. And, um, and then they get back together, and at the early part of the season, they're flying, doing this courtship flight, but they're really out of sync. And then a couple months further along, come January, they're all perfectly in sync, just doing this parallel flight. And I guess these are the things that allow a bird to have a relationship that withstands a year and a half 
of absence. Um, yeah, the um, the the March of the Penguins uh, movie resulted in a, a sort of funny set of folks saying, "Look, these birds show family values." Well, <clears throat> I thought that was really funny because the emperor, a penguin coming back to its colony. You know, it's the first day, it's like, where's my mate? I'm really excited to see my mate from last year. And second day, it's like, oh, gosh, I really wish my mate was here. And about day three, it's going, hey, you look really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's, let's start breeding. Um, these birds don't really, they, these guys have apparently some pretty solid family values as far as that's concerned. If uh, when a mate is lost, it typically, um, typically don't breed it that season typically don't form a successful uh, relationship, a successful new pair bond that year. Sometimes <laughs> yes, but far less often are they successful in raising a, uh, a, a chick. Um, more other species, gray-headed albatross, another every other year nesting bird, um, nests in some of the most inhospitable sites around and Consequently, is actually incredibly relaxed about people or any other visitors there. This bird was mildly perturbed as I sat down. You can't really do this anymore, but uh, this was a good 15 years ago. Sat down a couple feet away from it, and it sat back down and relaxed. And okay, that's cool. Um, I, I focus on albatross because. They're the most dramatic. They're the biggest. They're the sort of the most sublime of the of the tube noses. Of, um, but uh, maybe a little less loved, but no no less worthy. Ultimately, there's quite a few other in this group. Um, the uh, southern giant petrel, in this case, the bit of a vulture of the sea. Um, these are just a, a random scattering of of uh, of. Tube noses, white chin petrel, uh, northern fulmar, or as we typically just call it up here, fulmar. You can see these right off the coast here, um, and many, many smaller species, among of which are wonderfully successful and often very poorly known. Many of these, so there's new species being discovered among the the um, storm petrels. There's breeding species where we don't know where they breed at all. Um, here we have pintado petrel. Uh, a uh, southern fulmar on the far right, and then probably an Antarctic pet, uh, prion back there, um, doing what they do, which is making a living in places that uh, to us are utterly inhospitable. A um, little quick run through the diversity of penguins. There is, uh, if you're not too much of a splitter, uh, 17 species of penguins from the furthest south, the emperor penguin, and um, the world's cutest and most <laughs> difficult to ever see babies on the planet. Um, and uh, their close cousin, the king penguins, the two biggest penguin species, these guys being less southern. Uh, the brush-tailed penguins, the three species, the um, Adeli, Chinstrap, and, uh, and Gen 2 penguin. Um, the crested penguins, which as a uh, as a setter, oh, the funniest looking, but um, the most numerous in the species here is a royal penguin, a royal uh, rock copper penguin. There's also the snares crested, fjordling crested, and a handful of other crested penguins, kind of the rock stars of the, of the punk rockers of the, of the set. And then the burrow nesting penguins, these are the most northern living because they've managed to deal with places with predators. Uh, here, Magellanic penguin. Um, Galapagos, the only only penguin that has any regular business north of the equator in the Galapagos. Uh, the diversity of penguins we have today, you know, it's a group probably 50 million years old. We have a disproportionately small set of the penguins that have existed. Most penguins through the fossil record are in the smaller end of them, but there's a couple that have shown up that were truly gargantuan, 200 to 300 pounds. This one was actually a pretty recent find. In the last, uh, last I think, uh, 15 years, it was dug up uh, on the Peruvian coast, which really throws a, a bit of a curveball in that perspective that the biggest of these polar gigantism, there's a 300 pound penguin that uh, actually um, 
some of the early explorers found fossil remains of in the Antarctic. Um, but this was a tropical penguin, and um, a bill much more like maybe a cormorant, actually, um, but uh, was about stood about the stature of a of a human. Um, fantastic, uh, fantastic set of folks who have found because so albatross on one side they have distances effectively negligible for albatross because their flight is so efficient that with virtually zero effort in flying, there's virtually zero cost for going massive distances to feed and, and, uh, and hunt for food. Penguins are quite the opposite. It is even as efficient as they are swimming, even swimming hundreds of, uh, hundreds of miles on, on feeding trips, they still, that hundreds of miles, they still have to concentrate around some of the richest feeding sites. So you see a very disproportionate distribution of where penguins, well, penguins nest around the world, but because they don't tend to range more than a few hundred miles offshore, further afield in the off-season, but uh, in the non-breeding season, but uh, there, that's concentrated around, of course, where they are feeding, which is obviously very much the southern hemisphere and particularly around the southern ocean, this band of ocean that, um, that is uh, the, the, the richest waters in the world. Um, there's no penguins in the northern hemisphere, but, uh, but there was at once, or something like, I'm sure somebody knows what this is. Great Thank you. Yeah, great auk, which is related to Mirth, Alcid, that's very good. It's a relative of a puffin, and unfortunately for the great auk, it had a very narrow band in which it lived, which was south of the extent of seasonal sea ice and north enough that it uh, it um, was in very productive waters. And unfortunately, once humans found it, it didn't last very long. But we have in the northern hemisphere the ecological equivalents of penguins. But this is a compromise. These birds, the great auk was flightless, but uh, the rest of the alces, they can all fly. Uh, puffin, little auk, see these stubby little wings relative to the body um, as compared to an albatross on one side, but on, uh, compared to a penguin on the other here, Brunich's guillemots, or as we call them, thick billed mirrors. You can see the penguin body shape there. They are designed for efficient swimming, but it's a bit of a compromise because they still have to fly because they live in areas where there's quite a lot of predation. We have Arctic fox, we have um, polar bears, we have, depending on where they breed, um, more southerly terrestrial predators, and so by nesting on cliffs, they manage to get away from these predators for the most part, but um, they're not very efficient flyers, they're much more efficient swimming than most other uh, birds that dive for food, but they're nowhere near as efficient as a penguin. <coughs> that other extreme, taking advantage of the full ocean, open ocean, taking swim in flight to its absolute extreme in efficiency, are the birds that, evolutionarily speaking, see this and see it as a fantastic niche. This is a plankton bloom in the Southern Ocean by satellite image, a little bit of, of enhancement of the color, but you've got an area several hundred miles across there that is a massive bloom of this stuff, basically a raw building material of life, um, you know, various dinoflagellates and, and, and open ocean algae, which is fed upon by krill. Krill is, biomass wise, it is probably our only competition for volume of biomass as one animal or one species of human. There's probably more humans today than there is krill, but uh, probably just a couple decades ago there was more krill if you took all of them and stuck them in a pile, that is one species, you face the superb of the Southern Ocean krill, and all the people in a pile, it's only in the last few decades that there's probably more of us. Everything in the Southern Ocean ultimately feeds on krill, with the exception of a few bottom-dwelling creatures, but uh, plankton, of course, are the source of the krill's food. 
albatross, some of them feed directly on krill, mostly the albatross feed on squid and fish and other stuff that feeds on the krill. Penguins, they'll eat a lot of krill directly, also fish. Of course, our greatest uh, greatest species in the world, the, the great whales, um, are mostly going straight for the krill. And if you look at the tracks of albatross of the world, I love this stuff because being able to put a satellite tracking device on on albatross, what's not quite as, as new news now as it was uh, a decade or so ago, but um, we didn't used to uh, be able to see where these birds are, but you look at that concentration, it's pretty obvious where the goods are. You know, these birds travel open oceans to, uh, the, the open ocean is a desert, it truly is. It's, it's, the southern ocean is the richest of those open, open ocean deserts, but yet it's a desert and these birds will travel for days and weeks and through, uh, through the winter when they're not breeding months, just on the wing, actually sleeping on the wing, dynamic soaring where they're, they're literally extending less effort, if you look at the heart rate of an albatross sitting on its nesting grounds when it's resting, its heart rate is that's as low as it gets. Then there's flying, and then there's standing up. It takes it less effort to stand, uh, to fly than it does to stand up because the ring, wings are fixed rigid, there's no effort involved in holding their wings open. The actual effort is effectively equivalent to, you know, us more or less wiggling our fingers, which is the adjustment to maintain loft on with the wind as it varies in speed across the uh, across legs. So they're concentrating on the places that have the greatest uh, upwelling the, the greatest abundance of food, which maps very closely with measuring uh, productivity in terms of chlorophyll um, across the world's oceans. Here you see this band, the blues, the, the red is actually highest, and that's because coastal waters you get a lot more mixing. But uh, in terms of, you know, in terms of uh, open ocean productivity. The purple here is very low. Those are the low oxygenated, you know, very poor oxygen, very poor turnover.